I am Lori Caldwell. I am a sustainable uh, educator, garden educator here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, I love teaching. Uh, and so we're here today to talk about container gardening. Now, I am a very avid container gardener as I uh, live in the city of Martinez and we have a uh, very, very sandy soil. So I have opted to just do a um, simply a, a container garden for my garden uh, for the past several years, actually. So, um, uh, so please hold your questions to the Q and A, but I definitely want to hear them. So, um, bring them on when the question and answer period starts. So, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, big gardens in uh, small spaces: the adventures in container gardening. So, as I said, I have been a big uh, container garden for the past few years. Um, and we'll talk about the reasons why you might want to be a container gardener. Um, so our agenda for today, um, of course, the benefits of growing in containers. We're going to talk about the different container types, um, great things to plant things in. I'm also going to talk about size as well. Um, sunshine requirements, uh, soil fertility. This is something that is really, really important when it comes to container gardening as the uh, nutrition in a container is only limited to what's in the container. So I find as a container garden, you have to amend a little bit more often than you normally would if it was um, in ground, but we will definitely cover that. That's a really big deal for me. Uh, we're gonna talk about great crops for containers, um, about irrigation, watering, making sure that you have the appropriate drainage for containers as well, um, companion planting. Um, we're gonna talk about some typical pests um, that you will have to deal with. Um, and then of course, um, any tips and tricks that I might have um, as a container gardener. And then of course, at the end, we'll have a great opportunity for uh, questions and answers. And thank you all again for attending. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right, so let's talk about the benefits. Um, the benefits of container gardening are you can either expand your kind of in-ground garden capacity. So say you only have a small plot of land and maybe you wanna set aside that land for maybe some more deep rooted uh, fruits and vegetables or maybe a fruit tree or something. So you can expand on what you already have on your garden or if you don't have the space or the actual soil to put a garden in, uh, of course, container gardening is gonna be especially perfect for that. Um, you can grow fruits and veggies anywhere, on a balcony, in a backyard, in a front yard, um, anywhere where you can place a container where it's gonna get some good sun, um, that would be great. Um, you'll be able to move it with the sun, which is nice. You can't do that in ground. Um, and since the sun is in different places during certain times of the year, you can kind of move your garden um, to find the sun that you're going to need for germination and for to uh, make your plants grow. Uh, there's a lack of weeds. I'm not going to say that there is no weeds, but there are definitely a lot less weeds um, in container gardens than as opposed to um, an in-ground garden, which is nice. Um, you don't have to contend with any gophers, uh, which is also great, or moles, depending on uh, where you live. Uh, you don't have to deal with any kind of soil issues. Uh, like I said earlier, I have sandy soil. Um, some of you may have clay soil, which is a little bit more difficult for um, roots to penetrate through the soil. <coughs> Excuse me. Or you may have contaminated soil. Your soil may be contaminated with maybe something like lead, or you may be adjacent to a super fun site. We have several of those here in the Bay Area. Um, so you really don't have to contend with those in a container situation as well. Uh, able to control rapidly spreading plants, things like mint, or if you're trying to do things like ginger or horseradish or something like rosemary, um, keeping them kind of contained in the pot as opposed to putting them in the ground is gonna be uh, a lot beneficial for, for you. In the uh, instance of maybe like ginger or horseradish, it's just gonna make it easier for you to harvest it. You know, you can just empty out the entire container, take off what you need and go ahead and replant as opposed to having to kind of hunt and peck for the end of whatever's been growing in, your, um, growing in the ground. Um, garden accessibility, when you don't have it, of course I talked about that earlier, about the idea of being that you can grow anywhere. You can grow big, you can grow small. Uh, we're specifically talking about edibles today, um, but there's still a lot of great options if you want to um, bring in things like flowers or succulents. Containers are great for that as well. 
And of course, it's the ability to grow indoors as well as outdoors. And I can talk about the um, indoor part uh, as we kind of move along. Right. Some pictures from my garden. Um, the top, of course, is uh, basil that's gonna have to be thinned for sure, but I started off with a ton of seeds and this is where we are right now. Um, below, uh, I have beets and then to the right, um, I grew some brassicas, um, some members of the kale family. And while it's really, really compact in that container, as opposed to letting each plant grow individually, I just kind of chopped them off um, as they grew and kind of treated them more like a microgreen than a, a big plant. Of course, tomatoes, uh, garden, my garden, wouldn't it be complete without tomatoes and kale. Um, as you can see, they're pretty big pots, but I have three, um, three kale plants per pot. And that's another great thing about container gardening too. And don't be afraid to plant a couple of things a little bit more closer together than maybe you normally would, just to kind of maximize your, um, maximize your space. Um, onion in the forefront. Actually, that onion was a regrow. I bought a red onion and it sprouted. And so I decided that I would go ahead and plant it and put it in the backyard. Now I'm not gonna get another whole onion out of it, but the green part I'll be able to continue to chop and chop and chop for several months before it probably flowers and then resows right back into the pot. Um, my serranos from last year, uh, grown in a container as well. I got quite the bumper crop. All right. So what kind of container should I use? Of course, any kind of container is gonna be something that is gonna be safe for you, of course, to grow food in, um, of course. Um, so, but there's different container types. Uh, I have parsley over here on the left and another green onion uh, regrow on the right. It's always nice to be able to kind of regrow scraps if you can. All right, container types. So plastic. Uh, generally, I have a lot of plastic containers in my garden. Um, they will eventually break, um, but it usually takes a few years where they kind of break down and they become brittle and hard to deal with. Um, but they're still really good. They hold onto water a lot longer. Um, they can be cheaper. Um, in some instances, it's always an option for you to um, possibly get some from an old nursery, from a nursery who was giving them away, or check things like FreeCycle or Craigslist. Um, and get those in um, and pretty much in bulk. Uh, if you know someone who's a landscaper or another gardener, that's another way to, um, to get access to those as well. However, not knowing what the plant situation was inside that container, I always recommend that if you get any kind of container from somebody else, that you just go ahead and give it a good washout, just to be on the safe side um, to avoid things like uh, diseases or pests. You definitely don't want that to transmit onto your new plant. And plastic, um, when it's filled with soil, is definitely a lot lighter than, say, maybe ceramic or wood or something like that. And uh, ease of access for plastic as well. Uh, ceramic, while very nice, um, it can break easily. I do know that. I have broken several <laughs> ceramic pots in my day. Um, the unglazed versions have a tendency to dry quickly, um, and they can be kind of dear. They can be kind of expensive. Um, especially as you get to the bigger and bigger sizes. And then when you put soil in those guys, they get even heavier. Um, so, but they are great for things that are drought tolerant, things that require a fair amount of drainage. So it's great for succulents. It's great for like um, uh, perennial herbs, like oregano, or rosemary. Uh, ceramic does great with that. It's not gonna get too wet uh, and it's, um, it's gonna dry out a lot quicker, which is great for plants like that. Few more plants. Uh, lemon tree, um, I have that in a 10 gallon container. I'm about to transplant it though. Uh, it's been in a 10 gallon container for the past couple of years. This will be my second year with that. Uh, chives on the bottom, I love chives. Um, they actually last a, a fairly long time and they live um, in that five gallon bucket. Um, I had this for about, about two or three years before they seeded. And then I have some, um, what is that? <laughs> I just put the picture in there. 
Now I can't even remember what it is. I think it's kale, if I'm not mistaken. But don't quote me on that. All right. Some other container types, wood. Wood is nice because it actually does hold on to water a lot longer, but depending on the type of wood that you, oh yes, thank you, Jane. Yes, collards, pardon me. Thank you. <laughs> uh, they all, they will hold on to water longer. Um, eventually it will break down, however. So sometimes you'll get a good deal, maybe like an oak wine barrel. Um, they do need to stay wet and at least have something in them in order for them to kind of hold their shape. Otherwise they shrink and those rings unfortunately fall down. Um, and then the bottom eventually will kind of wear out. So there are some, um, some pros, definitely some pros and cons to having some wood, um, wood into your garden. Um, I just recently bought some um, planters um, that were made out of redwood. So I'm anticipating that because they are redwood, that they're definitely gonna last a lot longer than say maybe oak wood, just because that's what redwood does. They love water. So um, uh, fingers crossed on that one. Uh, metal, metal's nice, but sometimes metal can get hot. And if it gets hot, it's gonna dry out your soil. Um, there's a lot of those things, those large kind of trough containers that are used from kind of agricultural use. Those things are great. Um, I would recommend that if you do get those, there are some drainage holes as part of it, but I would definitely encourage you to maybe put some more um, more drainage holes on that as well in order to make sure it doesn't get all bogged down. Um, and if it does get dry, it's gonna start from the exterior, from the outside and work its way in. Um, so that may be something you may wanna consider on where you're gonna be planting something, maybe not close to the edge, maybe a little bit further into the, um, into the middle of it. Um, and they can be pretty expensive too, and it really all depends on um, what your budget is. All right, so my favorite options are reuse options. I'm a big recycler, upcycler, um, taking old stuff and making it into new. Um, in the picture, I have what is known as a beverage temp keep. I used to work for a catering company and um, this was a broken temp keep. It has a great drain hole in it. Um, it does hold water a little bit longer, so I decided to go ahead and put my oregano in it and not really have to water it that much at all because it will hold on to it. So things like five gallon buckets that either you can uh, purchase or maybe upcycle, maybe from a uh, bakery. Um, sometimes I've gotten them and the deli department at Whole Foods. And all you really have to do is just put some drain holes uh, in the bottom. You'd be surprised, five gallons is a pretty good standard um, size for containers. You can grow a lot of stuff in a five gallon container. Um, plastic totes. Um, food grade barrels, stuff like that. Um, I've been able to use a lot of those to um, grow food in as well. Uh, coffee cans, either plastic or metal. Um, sometimes the metal, like I said, metal has a tendency to dry out a little bit, but it's really good for uh, flowers. I did some nasturtiums in a couple of coffee cans this year. Um, and then of course there's the option of burlap. Uh, but burlap, since it is a natural fiber, is probably only going to give you maybe about one good season before it, um, before it conks out. So, but it is an option. Uh, here are my nasturtiums in uh, coffee cans. That was fun. I wasn't sure if that was going to work or not. Uh, planting directly in bags of soil. I have a friend, he decided that he didn't want to buy a container. Um, that he was just going to utilize his bag of soil as a container. He um, cut some holes in for his plants on the top, punctured some holes on the bottom, and put about two uh, tomato plants in there, and then caged them up and everything. And that's how they lived um, the entire uh, the entire growing season. So that's easy. And then, unfortunately, because tomatoes, you know, have a very fibrous root system, there wasn't much soil left in the container. So. Um, basically, it was very easy for him to dispose of it. Um, hanging baskets, you can either buy them or you can do them yourself. Just check out Pinterest. Pinterest has everything um, that you could possibly uh, want to learn about vertical gardening or hanging gardens or anything like that. Untreated palettes. Again, Pinterest has all kinds of pages on untreated palettes. Um, when you're looking at a palette or you see a palette that you wanna use, you're gonna to wanna to take a look and make sure it is marked with HT. 
Uh, that means it's been a heat treated pallet. So they've used it to cure it using heat as opposed to what they normally use it would be, which was a lot of toxic chemicals. So you definitely don't want that to come in contact with your, um, uh, with your food crops, of course. So heat treated is definitely a good way to go. Um, again, since most likely they've been kind of laying out somewhere, or maybe in a warehouse, a good washing, a good hard hose on it, and a good washing it off uh, would not hurt. And you can do a lot of things with, uh, with pallets. Uh, you can dismantle them. Um, you can just lay them right on the ground. Maybe put a nice barrier on the bottom of cardboard, uh, fill that up with soil, and you can just make a raised bed out of it. But you can do things either horizontal or vertical. If you do opt to do a vertical kind of garden, um, where it's lays flat like this, um, and then you make it upright. Just uh, my best suggestion would be to uh, allow the soil to kind of settle, then maybe plant it, and then kind of once the plants get a little bit established, then move it to more of a vertical, um, in a, in a vertical position. And again, they could also be hung. And again, Pinterest is really great uh, for stuff like this. All right, sunshine recommendations. Now, generally speaking, leafy vegetables need about a minimum of four hours. Anything that's gonna kind of produce a fruit, you know, a lemon or a tomato or a zucchini, they're gonna probably need about a minimum of six hours in order to, um, to do really, really well. And then shade loving edibles, they need about a minimum of about two to three hours. And of course, there are exceptions to this rule. In my backyard, my backyard is completely paved over and I'm surrounded by a six foot uh, redwood fence. Now, while the temperature in my front yard may be somewhere in the 70 to 75 degree range, the temperature in my backyard is at least, at least 10 degrees hotter, if not more. So if your area doesn't have well, I, the appropriate amount of sunshine, um, do take into consideration the microclimate that exists in your yard. If it's hotter in your yard, then that's gonna really help um, move your plants along, even if there's not a lot of sun. So please take that in consideration. I don't want anybody to think that um, you can't garden if you don't have you know, eight hours of full sun all day uh, in your yard. You can be very successful at this. Uh, but then again, like any other, any other thing in gardening, there's some years that things are going to die and there's some years that you're going to have bumper crops, but just keep on, just keep on pushing through and just keep on trying. You'll have more good years than you'll have bad years for sure. Um, so the type of soil for container gardening, I would definitely recommend a potting mix for container gardening, just for the fact that it has a lot of built in uh, drainage elements into it. And again, if you're trying to do container gardening because you really don't like your soil type or you're having problems with your soil type, then you definitely don't want to incorporate that in as part of your, uh, your, your container, as well as it's gonna make the container twice as heavy, um, most likely, especially with clay soil, um, than if you just use, go ahead and use a good quality potting soil. And for me, I like a simple potting soil where I can just read on the label and I know exactly what is in there and I recognize the words and all of that and there's a lot of different brands out there that can do it. When you do fill a container with the potting soil I'm um, just making sure that you're going to want to leave at least in a, a good inch gap um, along the top area so when it comes time for things like watering or mending you have a little bit of a um, you have a little bit of a thoroughfare so you can actually go ahead and do that and it makes it easier. Also too if you're also planting by seed, um, making sure that you have that gap. There have been times when I've planted something from seed, had the soil too close to the to the line, and the seeds have popped out when I've watered. So I have mint everywhere else around my pot, but definitely not in my pot because it's flown out. It forced it out. Um, I like to mix uh, potting soil with compost uh, before placing in the pot. Um, but again, if you don't have that, you could always add uh, compost to the top of the top of the soil. It's called top dressing. And then because um, new soils are usually kind of light and fluffy, there's gonna be a, a short period where as it starts to get wet and starts to get heavy, it's going to, um, <clears throat> it's gonna settle. It's gonna wanna settle. 
Um, and unfortunately, during those few couple of days as it's starting to settle, it's very fluffy. So when you water it, sometimes you'll find that it starts to kind of drain out of the bottom. And so to kind of avoid that, I either use like to use things like rocks. I'm a huge fan of using, <clears throat> pardon me, coffee filters, whether they be used or unused coffee filters, uh, just to kind of line the bottom of the container, um, just so that when the opportunity comes, once it finally does settle, water is still gonna um, go through it, still gonna percolate through there, uh, but the soil is gonna stay in place. And of course, eventually, because it is biodegradable, it eventually will break down and just disappear. But by then, your soil is gonna be all kind of nice and settled inside. So that works great. Um, I saw a quick question, I'm sorry, I'll go ahead and answer it. Um, with regular compost, you can do anything. You could do 50-50, um, 75-25. Um, the only thing I would, with the caveat, is if you decide to use something like worm castings, um, then with worm castings, I wouldn't use any more than 20%. They're pretty potent. Oh, here you go. The old coffee filter on the bottom trick. Again, a used one uh, works just as well, if not, uh, if not better, because it's already kind of has a little bit of coffee already kind of situated in that. And we'll talk about uh, using coffee um, as, part of the, um, as part of gardening, not just drinking it while you're out there looking at your plants. All right. Soil fertility. Again, this is really, really important to me. Healthy soil means healthy plants. Healthy plants means they're not gonna be preyed upon by pests as easy uh, as opposed to somebody else. Um, so it is very important for container gardening. I have a uh, pile of worm castings there and um, also known as worm poop. I use that exclusively um, in, in my container gardens. I usually actually I don't use it exclusively. I like to definitely like to mix it up. Uh, worm castings are generally higher in nitrogen. Um, so it's gonna feed a specific uh, area of the plant. Most likely it's uh, leaves and it's stems, just kind of what I call it, skeleton of the plant. And again, as I said earlier, nutrition is only limited to what's in the container. So feeding a container garden, you're probably gonna have to do that a lot more often than you normally would. And I find myself in situations where I'm probably feeding uh, my containers probably at least once a month, maybe every three to four weeks, depending on what's going on with the plant. And let the plant let you know, um, let the plant tell you what's wrong with it. And it, there's great ways to find out that. Um, like I said, you're gonna wanna feed often because it all really all depends on the type, uh, what it feeds on. So anything that is, say that's mostly leaf, say spinach or lettuce or cilantro. It's gonna require a lot more things like nitrogen as opposed to um, a tomato plant, which will need a fair amount of nitrogen in the beginning, but as it starts to transition and starts to flower and fruit, it's gonna need a lot more things like phosphorus. We'll get into that here. So I'm gonna to talk to you briefly about NPK for those who don't know all about NPK. Uh, NPK is the ratio of nitrogen to phosphorus to potassium. These are the major uh, building blocks um, for soil fertility. Um, like I said just a couple minutes ago, uh, nitrogen is responsible for um, the greening of foliage for leaves and stems and branches and just basically the I call the skeleton of the, of the plant. Phosphorus is responsible for the flowering and fruiting. That's what kind of pushes everything along as things start to flower and fruit. So you've ever been in a situation where maybe you've grown, um, you have a lemon tree and the tree itself is gorgeous. Uh, and maybe you get some flowers or maybe you don't get any flowers or maybe you get some flowers and they all fall off or you get some flowers and it kind of sort of turns to fruit and then the fruit falls off. Generally speaking, that means you just, just had enough phosphorus to get it to a certain point, and then the phosphorus kind of jumped off, and then the plant responded accordingly. Um, the last one, which is K, which is potassium, um, that's for kind of overall plant health, the metabolism, the kind of the vigor of the plant. You usually find that in usually small amounts if you're looking at soil amendments, and if you do, you'll find this ratio number, and I'll give you the indication of um, which is higher and what. 
higher in N is the higher nitrogen, higher in phosphorus means it's uh, going to be definitely higher in, um, in phosphorus for that fruit and flower development. All right. Great ways to maintain soil fertility. So top dressing. So as I'm preparing my garden for the season, um, I am going to most likely since I already have soil that I'm going to be reusing um, from year to year, which I highly recommend you do. Uh, all you have to do is just bring that fertility back to it. Um, unless it's completely been inundated with you know, a ton of roots, um, you may want to remove those roots. Or, or if there's something that's happened, maybe as a fungus that you, maybe you don't want to um, give another try for the next year, I can understand disposing of that. But other than that, all you have to do is just kind of bring that nutrition back to your plant, um, to your planter every single year. Top dressing would be just adding um, about one to two inches of compost right on top of the soil and then just kind of rake it in. Um, and then when you water, it's gonna definitely percolate down, hold on to um, water a lot longer, uh, be kind of a slow release um, nutrient so the plant will take it up slowly as opposed to something that's uh, petrochemical in nature. On uh, side dressing is what happens as your plants are starting to grow. Like I said, usually during the kind of the flowering fruiting period, um, it's kind of like puberty. Like we go through puberty, plants kind of go through puberty. They're going through the change, they're starting to grow up. And then as you know, for anybody who has teenagers, they eat a lot. And so side dressing is one of those things that are gonna be super important to help maintain, especially at this, this kind of junction of um, becoming fruit or becoming flowers, depending on what you're trying to grow. So you're gonna to wanna to add some materials during that time. And if it's something that does flower and fruit, of course, I'm gonna recommend something that's a little bit higher in phosphorus. Um, I'm a huge fan of bone meal in that instance, and I will use that um, during the flowering fruiting period for my containers, for sure. Heavy feeders, um, basically there's most of the plants that we grow are heavy feeders, meaning they take a lot of nutrition from the soil on a regular basis. Uh, the only exception to those rules are potatoes, which are usually universal cleaners, um, and members of the pea and the bean family, um, those are actually nitrogen fixers. They actually pull nitrogen from the atmosphere and uh, put it into, um, attach it to the roots, and that becomes part of the soil eventually. Um, I like to side dress usually with some sort of liquid applications because as the plant kind of starts to grow and develop, it may kind of extend over the bounds of the lips of your um, of your container. So <clears throat> liquid applications with a you know with a hose or with a uh, a waterer with a with a narrow spout make it a lot easier for you to kind of get in there towards the soil and make sure that um, you're able to side dress. And again, I side dress with all kinds of stuff, all depending on what the plant is. All right. I talked about compost. I will always talk about compost. Uh, the NPK for a compost is uh, one to one to one. So the nice thing about compost is it's kind of the great leveler. Um, all the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium are kind of level and e um, even and level. Um, so it kind of brings everything kind of back up to up to zero, which is nice. So that way, you know, from this point on, you can add other things to accommodate your plants, something nitrogen for leaves, something with phosphorus for flowers and fruit. Um, bone meal we talked about, alfalfa meal is another option. Um, one of my favorites is uh, fish emulsion, as seen here in the picture. Uh, it smells, oh, it smells horrible, but it works. Fantastic. So it's just a dilution um, in a bucket, and then you just add it to your um, add it to your uh, to your garden. Again, it's higher in nitrogen, so it's good for those plants that require it, and of course, those plants eventually are going to make fruit. So it's just going to give um, the skeleton a good chance. Because you'll notice sometimes if you, anyone's planting tomatoes right now, as the tomatoes start to flower. The bottom leaves start to brown, they start to get yellow, all that nutrition is being forced up to um, provide for the, um, for, the, for the future fruit. So it's important to make sure that you accommodate not only the skeleton, but you also accommodate for the, um, for the leaves and the stems as well. They're, work, they're doing work for you too, photosynthesis. All right, I am very frugal. 
I like to use things over and over again. And if I can use something that I have at home to garden, I will definitely do that. So I spoke briefly about coffee grounds. Uh, coffee grounds are a great, actually an excellent addition to any edible garden for a couple of reasons. Um, they are high in nitrogen, of course. Um, and even though after you've brewed them, the coffee grounds themselves still have a fair amount of acidity left over in them. And when you're growing edibles, acidity is important. You want your soil to be kind of slightly acidic. Uh, it makes it easier for the plants to kind of take up nutrients from the soil. So um, the nice thing about using coffee grounds is kind of a twofer. You've got that great nitrogen or you're going to um, provide that acidity for your plants. Now, I either usually do it one of two ways, especially if I'm going to be reusing the coffee grounds to do something else, maybe compost. Um, I might kind of rebrew them by passing water through the grounds again um, to make a dilution, and then I'll use that to water the plants. Or I'll take some dry coffee grounds and just kind of spread a thin layer on the top of my plants and kind of rake it in gently. Um, sometimes with coffee grounds, if you put them on too thick, sometimes they get a little bit, um, some fungus, and you definitely don't want that because the fungus is gonna wanna jump onto your plants. So in order to avoid that, that kind of thin to win, um, is going to be your best guess. And that's another reason why I like to do it um, in a dilution. But that takes a little bit of time if you already have coffee grounds. And coffee grounds are the kind of things that I would probably use on a pretty consistent basis, probably maybe even every couple of weeks as opposed to maybe something else. Just for the fact that I'm going to be watering my plants anyway, so why not add a little extra nutrition into it. Epsom salts are great, uh, they're great for nightshade plants. Actually, um, that's the one thing I have to do this week is usually give my uh, tomato plants or even my eggplant or sometimes my peppers, I will give them about a tablespoon of Epsom salts and water that in. Um, sometimes, like again, right now is it the tomato plants or the plants that produce fruits are kind of going through this transitional period and when a lot of the nutrition gets um, pulled out of the soil and magnesium, um, is one of those things. Magnesium exists even in our ground in very, very, very um, deep, deep areas of the soil. So it's even difficult for any kind of annual anyway to kind of grab it. So by using bringing Epsom salts, I'm bringing that into the, um, uh, bringing magnesium back into the soil. Uh, calcium uh, with crushed eggshells. Uh, you could do a couple of things again. Um, when you water it, the calcium leaches into the soil and it gives a little bit more rigidity to the annual stems, um, makes them a little bit more less likely to bend and break. Um, if, you gr if you crush them up finely um, and circle them around certain plants, um, it becomes a barrier for snails and slugs. They're definitely gonna, not going to want to cross over that because it's like, for them, it's like crawling over broken glass. So eggshells have a really great um, role in uh, any kind of garden, whether it be a container garden or an in-ground garden. And then finally, potassium, uh, the good old banana peel. You can dry it, you can grind them up, you can go ahead and apply that to the soil as well, and that's a great thing. Um, I have yet to find a good resource for uh, phosphorus. Uh, my mom has been experimenting with um, bones, and we've done a little bit of research on that as to create your own phosphorus or your own bone meal. Um, so you'll have to uh, uh, check back on that one. <laughs> Here we go. Epsom salts, my lovely coffee grounds. Um, and then in the top uh, left corner, I have incorporated fava beans. Generally, um, as I'm transitioning from, uh, from summer garden to my winter garden, I will plant fava beans in my containers and to bring some more nitrogen into um, to the soil without really having to do a lot of things. Also too, if I have no intention of doing a winter garden, this is kind of a great holdover for me. Um, I know that my soil is still very active um, because of the plants that are in there. And then I just have to chop them down after they've really flowered um, to really get the maximum benefits uh, for, um, for holding on to nitrogen. All right. The importance of healthy soil. Um, it's gonna definitely increase the water holding capability in your soil. So that way you don't have to worry about watering as often. 
Um, it's gonna keep the temperature and the moisture levels at a good balance. And this is especially important because when your plant is kind of forced to go through periods of like wet and dry, wet and dry, or hot and cold, hot and cold, that's gonna stress your plant out definitely. And a stressed out plant is gonna be a, um, just a treat for every pest in your neighborhood to come and want to attack for sure. So um, building healthy soil and using these techniques are a really great way to kind of just keep everything at a nice even keel, keep your plants healthy. When they're healthy, they're gonna go ahead and give you more of whatever that you're trying to grow, more flowers, more fruits, um, more beans, more anything. All right. So let's talk about what you can grow in a container. Let's talk about perennials first, because I really like a good uh, perennial in a container. I have a fig, I have a lime, and a lemon. Um, those are my three perennials that I currently have. I'm hoping to add tree collards, which are pictured here um, as part of my container garden as well. Um, fruit trees, of course, dwarf fruit trees are the best. Um, I would even recommend a dwarf fruit tree for even if you're having it in ground um, garden, just for the fact that dwarf trees are easily a lot easier accessibility. Um, who wants to tackle with the 20 foot fruit tree? And then of course, all the best fruit is gonna be on the top of that 20 foot tree, uh, all accessed only to birds and to squirrels and not necessarily to you. And I, I don't give away free fruit to squirrels and birds. <laughs> uh, strawberries, especially things in hanging baskets. The nice thing about strawberries is, <clears throat> excuse me, they don't require a lot of soil. They actually not prefer it. I've seen a lot of things where people have done strawberries in, um, gutters. They've gone and bought gutters, gone to a hardware store, capped them off, and then hung them on their fences. And they're able to just kind of hang pendant, do a couple of versions of that. Um, because like I said, they really don't require any really deep, uh, deep, deep, deep soil. Things like blackberries, which are kind of difficult because they want to poke out of the bottom of the pot. Um, and then artichoke. Something is going to be large. That's kind of like a half wine barrel size kind of project would be an artichoke, but you can do it and you can be successful to do that as well. Um, on the right is my lime tree from, uh, this was my first year. I got a lot of limes on it. Um, it's a rang pour lime. That's why the um, skin is uh, orange. It's a mandarin uh, crossed with a lime. I really like it. It's a lot juicier than your more traditional limes. So I really like it. And it's really been producing a lot. Um, on the left is a Meyer lemon, but it's in a spalliade. So it's gonna be flat up against any kind of wall. So if you're looking to kind of save space and a spalliade fruit tree um, could be a really good option for you. But you have to keep continuing to, to train along that top edge though. All right. Uh, annuals, most annual veggies, except for things like corn. Corn doesn't work. Um, you need a lot of space for corn. Um, perennial or annual herbs, um, any kind of culinary or even medicinal herbs work well, or things like edible flowers, like bachelor buttons or nasturtiums, pansies. Um, these could all be also grown in containers as well. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, irrigation, watering, and some drainage. Now, in the for my containers in the summertime, especially things that are, that are really trying to produce a lot of fruit at this time, like my lemon tree is really kind of going, and so is my lime tree. I'm going to put saucers underneath the containers to kind of catch the water. Um, it, like again, it gets really, really hot in my backyard, so I want to make sure that the the water stays. So if my my pots are slightly dried off and the water kind of really percolates through, the sauce is gonna catch it on the bottom and then the plant's gonna go ahead and take that up later on in the day. So that way I'm really holding on to as much water as I possibly can. Um, water in the morning or the late evening, um, please make sure to kind of water the soil as opposed to watering the leaves. Um, sometimes you'll see these little dark spots on your leaves and generally that means that there's been water that's been sitting on that leaf and it's been attracted to the sun. So like a magnifying glass, it's gonna kind of burn a little tiny hole 
um, into the, to the layer in your leaves. So you will try to avoid that by watering in the soil mostly. Um, in the evening, if I'm gonna water my garden, I probably water it after the, 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 my garden is in full shade. Uh, warm enough that if the, some of the leaves do get wet, there's gonna be enough heat for it to evaporate off. Um, but then that'll also have to be out there in the heat of the, end of the day watering as well. <clears throat> I do like hand watering for a couple of reasons. Um, I like it because I'm able to um, check and make sure that what I'm watering actually does need to be watered to try to avoid the um, being it over wet or, or under wet. Um, also too, I like hand watering because it forces me to kind of slow down and take a look at my garden. Do I have a tomato hornworm that I haven't noticed because maybe I've um, done, maybe done drip irrigation that comes on automatically. Oh, I've got new fruit or I've got this weird pest or, you know, where did this acorn come from? Now I've got an oak tree growing in a container. So um, hand watering kind of forces you to slow down a little bit and um, kind of take stock in your garden. But I do understand that some people are really, really busy and maybe they don't have time for um, to do hand watering. So drip irrigation, of course, is going to be um, something that I would definitely recommend. And it's very easy to set something up, even if it's just something from a hose bib. Um, and then there's a lot of great resources that you can find um, to help you kind of with that. Go to your local hardware store or even an irrigation supply store. Um, they can be really, really helpful for that as well. Um, straw mulch is great for holding on to water longer, but one to two inches um, mixed in with your annuals. I'm just gonna help uh, uh, block weeds as well as to hold on to moisture a lot longer, which is important. And then a coarse mulch, usually for something like perennial plants. So again, um, it's gonna help control weeds, which not too much of a problem with container gardens, um, but for the most part, it's gonna hold on to moisture a lot longer in the soil. Just be careful that when you do use mulch, that you don't get too close to the main stem of your plant. You're gonna want a little bit of a little bit of space because the fact that it does have great water holding capabilities, if it's too close, then it may cause a problem um, with your plant. So that's just a caution right there. Now, like I talked about during the summer months where I put saucers underneath, in the winter months, I raise all my containers um, onto blocks. As you can see, my backyard is, is paved over. So unfortunately, sometimes what happens is with containers, when they're kind of in contact with say maybe the ground or with mud or even with these pavers, sometimes as it gets wet, it creates this kind of suction that blocks a drain hole. And so as, um, as you water or even especially in the winter time, as it rains, um, it really, it, there's no drainage as part of your container. So that could, that's definitely a plant killer. So I like to raise up mine on bricks or rocks, or I sometimes I even take the saucers that I had from the previous year and I flip them, two of them over, and I kind of put a pot on to straddle, um, straddle the two of them. So that's just a quick tip for that one. Uh, I found that it's going to help save your plants a lot, especially if you're going to, if we have really, really heavy rainy seasons. And on kind of on that then, as you notice, and you may notice, as if you have a container garden, during the good couple good rainy seasons, um, it has a tendency to really kind of flush out a lot of nutrients. The more rain is gonna flush out, not a lot of nutri nutrition. So in the winter time, if you are having a, uh, having a garden in the winter time, um, I highly recommend that you still kind of implement those soil fertility techniques in order to really keep that soil fertility up in your, and um, to keep your, your plant nice and healthy. All right. Now, I am not a huge fan of gadgets in the garden, but however, I am going to make an exception for this one. This one is a moisture meter. Um, I got it as a, uh, as a gift and I love it. And it's made it possible for me to not over water or not underwater any on un all of my containers. Um, it's like I said, it's been a really big game changer. I'm able to uh, probe it before I have an opp opportunity to, um, to water 
And so now I know I'm like, okay, I can wait. This is really moist. I can wait a couple of days or this is really dry. I can go ahead and water it now. Um, if you don't, then you can always use the good old finger test. I'd probably use the middle finger, which is um, the longest. See if you can get down all the way down to your hand and just feel what that soil's like. It might feel cool, but you want it to feel wet. Cool is something entirely different. You actually want it to actually feel some moisture in it. And then you know you can go ahead and give it some good water without overwatering it for sure. All right. Companion planting. Now, this is the, the thing where you're gonna grow uh, plants together for usually for mutual benefit or for pest control. Um, my examples is uh, carrots and tomatoes. Uh, there is a great companion book uh, called Carrots Love Tomatoes because they don't compete for resources. Um, the carrots, they prefer the shade. Tomatoes, they love the sun. Carrots grow down. Uh, tomatoes grow up. And right now, this is the time of year that if you have tomatoes and you're putting it out, now would be a great opportunity to go ahead and implement some carrot seeds along, along the base of your tomatoes. Still kind of in the sun if you can, um, but because carrots need that warm um, soil in order to germinate. And then as the tomato plant starts to grow, it's gonna shade out those carrots and those carrots are gonna continue to thrive. And then after your season's over, you can pull out the tomato plant carefully, of course, and then you'll just have carrots to kind of push you through, um, through the fall. Uh, tomato and basil are also great companion plants. Uh, while they are tasty together on our dinner plate, they do work really, really well together um, as they grow. Basil helps repel pests from tomatoes. And again, they really don't have too much of a competition with each other. Speaking of pests. Um, in the top left, we have the cabbage worm, that, that lovely white cabbage moth you see fluttering in around your garden and you say, oh, that's so cute. It's not so cute. They lay their eggs on your plants and then you end up with the cabbage worm and then that guy is going to tackle um, any and all plants that uh, they see fit. On the bottom, we have slugs and snails. That's a snail, of course. Um, they are sneaky little guys who like to come out and late night and early in the morning to eat your plants. Uh, and then we have on the far right, the lovely tomato hornworm. Um, as you can see, their color is great for mixing in with other plants. Um, the one thing about the tomato hornworm is um, either you can notice whether or not that they are, um, they're there, of course. Uh, but if you look down at your lower leaves, you'll see their droppings. It just looks like uh, just droppings on the lower leaves. So make sure you kind of look up in your plants as well in order to pay attention for those. For cabbage worm, um, you're going to have to definitely hand pick them. I always like if I'm growing cabbage or any member of the cabbage family, I am going to um, look on the underside of the leaf. Um, I look on top of the leaf and look for eggs. Sometimes I go in with like a Q-tip or a um, cotton swab and with some rubbing alcohol and I'll just rub the leaf and try to rub off as many of the eggs as I possibly can. For snails and slugs, there's a lot of things you can do. There are barrier methods in order to get, kind of keep them under control. Um, in the past, I've used things like um, two liter bottles that I've cut the bottoms off and then maybe I've covered the tops with something meshy, a cheesecloth or an old nylon or something. And I've go ahead and made like kind of a cloche for them and covered my plants um, at nighttime, when, of course, when they come out. Um, this is also gonna help protect them um, in that kind of weird transition period um, where it might be get some cooler temperatures at night. So it's gonna protect the plants from uh, cooler temperatures as well, protect them from snails and slugs as well. Um, you also do have the option of going out at night with the flashlight and hand picking them. That is also another option. And uh, another option for getting rid of snails and slugs would be just take an old wooden board and place it somewhere in your garden. Again, snails and slugs come out in the middle of the night and as the sun comes up, they're gonna need to find a place to hide. They're most likely gonna try to hide underneath that wooden board. And then all you need to do is just walk on that wooden board, squishing them underneath your feet. When you're done, you just lift it slightly so they can get themselves underneath there. And then you don't even have to deal with them. They can be killed sight unseen.
Um, <clears throat> a lovely sunflower. Uh, the white speckles on that sunflower leaf are aphids. Um, those are your probably typical. Um, they like to suck uh, nectar, suck moisture out of your plants. Um, and but along on that sunflower, as you can see, um, are juvenile lady beetles. And I encourage you to um, do a little research and kind of find out what the life cycles of your beneficial insects are. You might be surprised that this doesn't traditionally kind of look like a lady beetle, but it kind of sort of does look like a lady beetle. These are the hungry teenagers. These are the ones that eat hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of aphids on any given day. So it's always good to kind of keep them safe. And then also too with pests, you kind of have to accept some sort of level of pests in your garden. If you want those beneficial insects to come to your garden, you have to have food for them uh, to eat. So sometimes you kind of have to do a sacrifice play. I had a year where I had three broccoli plants. One of them was completely inundated with uh, aphids and the other two were fine. So I told myself that if they jumped off the sun, that I would do something. But other than that, I left the broccoli plant on its own. It, they killed it, of course, um, but um, they left my other broccoli plants alone, of course. Um, let's see, we talked about cabbage worms, tomato hornworms, white fly. Unfortunately, I don't have a good, good picture of it, but it just kind of looks like fluff, just fluff stuck to your, your plants. And there's some great little um, non-toxic sprays that you can use uh, for that. I think I did include that as part of the Dropbox link. Um, there should be a whole host of handouts and things about pest control um, and stuff like that. But I think everybody will have an opportunity to get um, after the fact. Is that right, Nicole? Yes, we'll send a we'll send a link. We'll put it in the um, chat, and then we'll also send it to people via Great. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you want to grow ahead and grow food, of course, but you're definitely going to need pollinators in order to um, make some of these things happen. So um, making something that is gonna attract those beneficial insects or attract those pollinators um, is especially important. In the top corner, I have um, the, um, the California poppy, which bees love. And then if you look at the sweet alyssum, um, the, white, the white flower. Now, sweet alyssum gets a bum wrap. It can be kind of invasive. This might be one of those things that you might wanna put in a container, even though it does have a tendency to kind of re-sow. Um, but it's that kind of multi-flowered head, similar to the plant that you see below you, which is yarrow, which is my favorite plant for attracting beneficial insects and pollinators. Um, they really like that kind of multi-flowered, um, with yarrow, it looks like a kind of a flat landing pad. Um, butterflies like that, of course, bees like that. And I've seen um, the whole entire life cycle of the lady beetle just on the yarrow plant, because the mature lady beetle, they eat the nectar and they eat some of the pests, but then they lay their eggs and then the juveniles come on out and they do all the heavy work. So um, it's always important to try to, you know, do that. I've also incorporated things like marigolds in my garden this year as well in order for, for a kind of more of a natural pest control as well. Now, if your plants are drought tolerant, of course, I'm gonna recommend maybe putting them in a terracotta pot, which is gonna increase the drainage on it or if you have a bigger container, you're gonna to wanna to plant on a little bit of a mound as opposed to in a bowl, just to kind of increase the drainage because drought tolerant plants definitely don't like to get their feet wet. So you're definitely gonna to wanna to make sure in order to keep it alive um, that you kind of plant it on a mound. Um, let some of your plants go to seed at the end of the season. I highly recommend it for a couple of reasons. Number one, it provides um, some habitat, provides some food generally towards the end of the season, um, as well as a great opportunity to save seed. This is my parsley plant. Um, it's when it first started to flower and went to seed. And then I basically just bent it over and now it's bent over in this already existing pot. So as it drops the seed, it's gonna re -sow itself and then I get parsley back again. But I really a huge fan of saving seeds. And if you could do that, um, I highly recommend it. And I do have a handout for that. I can include that in the uh, Dropbox link if anybody else is interested at the end. I don't think I originally had included it. All right. 
So for more information, uh, you want to check out the website for our partner here for sustainablesolano.org. They have, um, they're going to be doing some gray water, some laundry to landscape workshops. I'm a huge fan of laundry to landscape um, as part of uh, irrigation for perennial crops. I think they work really, really great. Um, it's a great way to save water, uh, especially during the drought season as well. Uh, you can find me on Facebook and Instagram. Just look up Compost Gal. That's me. Uh, and again, um, the handouts are going to be available to everyone as well as a copy of this PowerPoint presentation as well. So for those who um, need some additional notes, as well as the handouts that I would normally hand out in a regular class, um, those will all be available. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lori. It's just, You're I love your presentation. It's awesome. Um, Thank you. So much to think about. And uh, I always learn something new, <laughs> so I'm always taking notes here. Um, we'd love you guys to fill out a short survey because this like helps guide us on what classes that you would like and what else we can bring. So it really helps um, us with that. And Allison's going to um, it's called Survey Monkey, and so it's popping up, and I think I just saw it. Um, and now it's time for Q&A. So I would love you guys to raise your hands. That's going to be the easiest way to get some questions answered. And then you can ask them directly to Lori. We're all out of our comfort zone here, trust me. This is the last thing mm -hmm. I struggle with is <laughs> being on videos. So please, um, if you have questions, the uh, best way is going to be to raise your hand. I just want to do a clear oh, picture. Here we go. This is my right. art for this year. And then, right, so um, just tell us your name and where you're from and then your question. And I'm going to unmute you. All right, go ahead, Nikki. Nikki? Let's see. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Oh. Oh, she says she can't use the mic. Ah, okay. Well, let's look at her question and just chat, put it in the chat box and we'll. Ah, uh, the name of the orange colored lime, Lori. Oh, Rangpur, uh, R-A-N-G-P-U-R, Rangpur lime. Rangpur. R-A-N-G, what? P-U-R, Rangpur. Lime, okay. All right, awesome. Super juicy, really sweet, I really like them. They're still a little, tart like a lime should be but they're definitely way juicier than a lime i've been so disappointed with limes lately okay <laughs> here's some more questions we've got um is compost the same as plant food this one uh yes and no so compost its main like i said its main goal is to kind of uh kind of even out the soil so it can it does provide nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium but kind of in equal levels, as opposed to maybe like a bone meal, which is going to be higher in phosphorus, or like an alfalfa meal, um, like it's going to be something higher in nitrogen. I highly recommend that you use all of those, um, but of course I'm going to recommend that you use compost. Uh, worm castings, uh, which is a worm compost, is going to be higher in nitrogen than anything else. So it's a little bit different. With worm castings, you're going to want to treat them more like a fertilizer, in a soil amendment, so that's why I recommended maybe using no more than 20%. Um, mix it with your 80% potting soil, or if you're gonna make a dilution of worm castings, you're gonna wanna dilute it to the color of, um, of a weak tea, or kind of like a muddy kind of tea, and use that, that way you don't have to worry about trying to overuse it. Awesome. Now we have a question from Ro, a devout Lori follower. So I'm gonna unmute. Let's see if we can get Ro to talk. Hi, Lori, can you hear me? I can, hello, Ro. Is this Ro from Dublin? Yes, ma'am, I was just typing in a little <laughs> question saying the Jade Circle lawn conversion is fabulous. So thank you for all your help with that. 
You're welcome. And I do have a question with, you may have cracked the code on the lady beetle. I have a gorgeous um, Salvia Clevelandi, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, Winifred yeah. Gilman. It's Blue Sage. Any case, um, gorgeous bloom, blooming, and all of a sudden I kept noticing these tiny little red bugs, and I thought, oh, how cute. Those are ladybugs. I'm wondering now if they're being attacked by lady beetles because the gorgeous plant is now unfortunately deteriorating and for the life of me I can't stop it and I'm if that's the case curious what you would suggest on how to handle those lady beetles well it sounds like if I mean most likely the lady beetles are not taking down your plant do they look like little spiders <laughs> or do they look like lady beetles do they have legs you know I honestly from what I saw, they looked like lady bugs, but I did not pull one off to look at it closer. Maybe what I'll do is I'll get as close as I can and just zip you a picture, see if you can identify. Okay, that'd be great. Sometimes what happens though, it's if you have a, say maybe like an aphid infestation, um, you may see ladybugs there. They're primarily there for the, of course, for the all-you-can-eat buffet. I so that that aphids. might be, I'm sorry, what? I do see the aphids. Okay, so yeah, the aphids. So with aphids, um, you can make a non-toxic spray. I take about a cup of water and I do a tablespoon each of uh, vegetable oil and like a non-phosphate dish soap. And then I'm just going to spray the heck out of that. Um Usually, probably, again, you know, I would still kind of follow kind of the watering guidelines, um, not just to, um, you know, spray in the middle of the day when it's hot, uh, maybe in the morning or um, late in the evening, or just give it a good hard hose, um, take a good hard sprayer, um, but you don't want to really bump off the lady beetles because they're really there trying to do that kind of that hard work. I'm sorry to hear about the, um, the aphids, though. Well, you know... I I'm not 100% certain, but I was curious, you know, the sheet mulching, which produces fabulous nutrient-dense soil, I'm curious if the salvia is such a deep rooter, maybe there is some dense um, clay soil that it's struggling with underneath. I'm, I'm guessing, so maybe I'll just send you pictures so yeah. that everyone else chat, but um, would love to chat more offline about it, so thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Ro. Thanks, Ro. All right, we've got a question from Vanessa. I'm going to unmute you, Vanessa. Are you there? I am. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Um, I'm just a very, very beginner. I've never really gardened, so I'm just wondering if you could give us a tip on just where to start with container gardening. Oh, sure. Um, usually I ask people like, what, like, what is it you want to grow? Are you, do you want to grow food? Like what's your favorite, what's your favorite food? What's your favorite summertime kind of yeah. fruit? Yeah. My, my thing is mm -hmm. just the easiest thing that I could grow <laughs> that would actually work. <laughs> you know what? You really can't go wrong with tomatoes. Uh, you really can't go wrong with herbs as kind of your first, your kind of first foray into gardening, um, especially during the, you know, especially during the uh, springtime. So I usually tell people, what do I like to eat or what do I like to cook with? Um, and then I kind of go from there. But tomatoes are pretty easy. Um, herbs are pretty easy as well, just to give you enough confidence. But then again, sometimes, like I said, there are some years that things go really, really well. This is the first year I've been able to successfully grow cilantro in probably like four or five years. And I probably won't be able to do it next year, but for whatever reason, um, some plants are kind of particular. But yeah, just start small, you know, start with one container and see kind of how you like it. A couple of little quick tips with tomatoes. I'm oh, sorry, mm -hmm. go for it, go, go for it, Vanessa. Oh, I was just gonna ask you that, yeah, so for tomatoes, like what exactly, where would I start, what would I do? <laughs> um, well, get yourself, you can do most containers, uh, tomatoes do pretty well in a five gallon pot or maybe you can get larger. I would say the larger the tomato, the larger the pot should probably be. So 
say maybe you want to start off with maybe like a cherry tomato plant. You could start easily with, you know, with one, um, a one five gallon, uh, one five gallon pot and some, um, some potting soil. You're just going to go ahead and plant it. And when it comes to tomatoes, right now, as they're starting to kind of be mostly kind of leaves, um, you're going to want to, you know, water pretty often, make sure it doesn't get dried out or anything. Uh, but as the tomatoes start to develop, I have a tendency to want to pull back a little bit on the water. You're not going to want to water all the same because too much water during the fruiting period is going to give you watery fruit. So you want to give it enough water to kind of keep it alive, of course, um, but not so much that, um, uh, that you end up with a watery tomato. You can go to the store and get a watery tomato just like that, probably right now. <laughs> So yeah, so start start small and see how you feel about it and how you like it. Um, if you live here in the Bay Area, don't be afraid to experiment in the fall and the winter time too. We have uh, good enough weather that we could do cool crops like things like broccoli or kale or chard or um, bring on citrus fruits, things like onions and garlic. Um, there's a lot of stuff that you can do um, in your garden. But again, like I said, start small don't get frustrated and you know just make sure that you just keep those on um, those pots fed with you know some organic materials thank you so much and just are there any ones that we can grow inside as long as there's a lot of light um herbs would be great for that um anything that's not going to require something that's going to pollinate or have to be pollinated so herbs are really great for that you can do like like basil or thyme or oregano um even rosemary you can do all that. Um, just be careful sometimes something happens when the sun comes through a window, it has a tendency to uh, intensify even more than it would be outside. Um, so just be careful that it doesn't kind of burn, um, burn your leaves. Um, I have a friend, um, she used to live in an apartment in Oakland and she grew tomatoes in her, her um, balcony without a balcony. She just, Put them in front of a big window and threw some uh, curtains over the top of them and kind of created a small little kind of greenhouse space um, in her garden in her actually in her bedroom so you can grow indoors definitely and there's, you're a welcome, of, there's a lot of great resources all you you have a ton of um just different um flyers that talk about what size pot and stuff so oh yeah link there's you've got all kinds of resources that are great for beginners so i encourage you guys to look at those so let's unmute jess k here I can hear me. hello jess hello yes can you hear me yes yeah we can hear okay you. Okay, cool. <laughs> Last time I tried to talk, they couldn't hear me, so I just wanted to make sure. Um, simple question. Um, should you add actual worms to container gardens? Not necessarily. Um, my thing is if you add enough organic material into it, um, that you really you don't really don't have to. Um, they won't most likely have access to your to your garden. Um, but if you include their uh, include their poop in there, um, that that'll make them very happy. I'm not them very happy. It'll make you very happy. Right. So yeah, I wouldn't necessarily I would... recommend okay putting, putting worms in there. Okay. Thanks. And now it's just like an easy way to add that to it. You know, <laughs> kind of oh, put sure. them in and let them multiply and do their thing. <laughs> I mean, I recommend that if you're interested in worms that, you know, worm composting, it would be great. I have um, two compost bins, worm compost bins that just sit in my living room. So if you don't think you have a lot of space, you can easily do worm composting um, in, in the smallest space possible under your sink or mine's right next to the front door. All right. Thanks for your question, Jess. We got Lisa here. I'm going to unmute Lisa. Lisa, are you there? Hi, I'm here. Hello. Hi. Hello. Um, hi. Thank you so much. I'm having so much fun. Um, okay. I actually had a couple of questions, so I'm going to talk a little fast because I don't know where else to get the answers to these. Um, okay. How do I know if I'm buying good soil? I've bought soil in bags, and then my dad's like, "There's a bunch of wood in here. This is this is garbage." And so, how do I know? You know, I'm a huge label reader. Um, 
And so uh, usually sometimes with some of those mixes, they do uh, incorporate the wood fiber, mostly just because it holds onto water. So it's gonna hold onto water a lot longer because it's also mixed with some kind of draining elements. So okay. if you know that if you know that's the type of soil that you have, um, that you already kind of have that you're already kind of working with, um, mm -hmm. just know that it's going to hold on to water a lot longer for certain. Um, and then there may be a couple instances, especially in the winter time or as we kind of transition from kind of winter to spring, um, if the containers that you have, you might get some fungus. There might be some mushrooms that kind of appear. That's just something mm -hmm. that's totally natural. Um, but again. I usually read the label and see, you know, what does it have? Does it have, you know, worm castings or poultry manure, or sometimes okay. it's a little bit of fur bark, but you know, um, it's always best to kind of do a good label reading in order to be sure. Well, I didn't know if there was a brand that you'd recommend, or I was thinking about maybe a little dump truck in my driveway one load, It'd be cheaper to buy it that way, but they're, I just don't know. It's trickery. Where do well, you yeah. Live, Lisa? Where do you live? Um, Fairfield. Okay, there's some resources. We've got a, a link on our website for um, soil resources, and we have a real. There's some good ones, so I will um, put that in. Um, so you, because you're local. Oh, yeah, that would be great. And um, my other one was, how do you control slugs and snails and hornworms when you don't like to kill anything? Okay. <laughs> Okay, well, really quick on your soil question, if you decide to buy your soil in a bulk mm -hmm. yard, um, it's great because you can actually touch it. You can smell it, um, and mm -hmm. I highly recommend you just get in there and take a look at it, um, and, and it ends up being a little bit cheaper, and then you really don't have to worry about um, uh, things like plastic bags. So, and, and that's okay for pots, to buy it like that, and do I have to add vermiculite or all that? You can, and if you do, I'm not usually a big fan of vermiculite just because it's kind of comes from it's a mined resource and it kind of comes from oh, okay. afar. But sometimes with that, you have to. Um, but then again, it all depends on the the pot that you're using. That you may need some more uh, some more additional drainage for that. Um, but a lot of potting soil already kind of has it built into it. But Perfect. if you do kind of buy like a veggie blend or kind of a garden bed soil, then um, mm -hmm you may want to try to implement some um, some additional drainage in that too. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's what they're calling it. They're saying it's 50% topsoil, 50% compost. And I thought that didn't sound good. Yeah, it, gets, it, it, it might be a little heavy if it's topsoil. Usually they're trying to go for sandy loam um, where it's a okay. good moist, good mixture of kind of clay and sand for that for that drainage as well as that as well as the compost as well. Okay. I'll look at the um, resource list since I'm local. Yeah, please do. And then as far as the snails and slugs are concerned, um, <clears throat> you can build traps. Um, the old traditional, um, you could do barrier methods like I talked about with the, um, the eggshells, you mm -hmm. know, being able to kind of go around your plants with very crushed up eggshells in order to kind of create a barrier. Um, there's beer traps. You know, you're just going to put a shallow, a container of cheap beer don't give them the good stuff cheap beer and they're going to be attracted to it and they're going to fall in and then it's okay. kind of just on you to kind of pick it up and just dump them out um the board okay. method that's kind of out of sight out of mind kind right. of situation um for tomato hornworm um it might be a little bit difficult sometimes because sometimes when um i didn't get a chance to really talk about crop rotation depending on where the sun is in your yard and where they're not you use your soil um, you can kind of rotate your crops throughout different pots. So say you did, you know, tomatoes in this 10 gallon pot this year, I'd probably put it in another one because the only reason why you end up with tomato hornworm is because the moth has come and laid eggs at the base of um, your existing tomato plant. And then if you go ahead and put a new tomato plant in the same oh. pot the following year, then that tomato comes up, those eggs hatch, and then that, um, that tomato hornworm has its food already uh, in its face when it's born. So. Can I just get rid of the top five inches of soil and put it somewhere else in the yard to get keep get them out of there? Um, I guess you could. I mean, it all depends. I'm really not sure how deep. I'm sure it probably doesn't go too too deep in the soil. Um, okay. Tomato hornworms. Uh, usually, if I have to contend with them, 
Um, I'm going to treat them kind of like dog do. I'm going to put a plastic bag over my hand and I'm just mm. going to grab it and then pull the bag and then just go ahead and set that aside and put it okay, in. Okay. Sometimes good. you have to do some, sometimes you have to do a little bit of hunting, you know, but you know, if that, you know, you got a roommate or you got, you know, a child or something <laughs> and take that on for you. Um, I would definitely enlist them, bribe them with fresh produce or something or <laughs> something that you make out of their fresh produce, get a neighbor kid. Um, yeah, just, you know, find a way to get it. Cause they will decimate a tomato plant for sure. Yes. I've never mm -hmm. found one ever, but I've had my plants be gone over and I've never, ever found one. So, okay. Well, I have another question. I'm going to go ahead and rotate down to the back of the line here. So everyone else can get it, get in. Sure. Thanks. Lisa. Okay. Yeah. There's a bunch of, questions. thank you, Lisa. Thank you. All right. Let's get Portia. Great questions, everyone. Thank I you. Oh, it is. Portia. Hi, Lori. Thank you so much. Um, I have like a ton of questions. So I'm going to do this like rapid fire style. Um, how okay. far apart should you plant tomato plants? I've been guilty in the past of planting them too closely together. Thought I had like 12 inches and they needed like more than that. So what's the recommended spacing for tomatoes in like a raised bed? in a raised bed generally depending on the big so as i go from like cherry tomato to kind of like beef steak tomatoes i'm gonna want to increase the you know increase the width so anywhere from like a cherry tomato i could probably do like a foot apart and as i get bigger and bigger and bigger i'm gonna go ahead and um uh go probably up to up to two feet for like something like a beef steak or what they call like mortgage lifter kind of like Semi softball size. <clears throat> okay. Hmm. And then, but then um, you also have, I'm sorry, but then you, you have also have the option of <clears throat> removing some of the, um, the, some of the leaves to kind of create kind of the space to kind of, space. Kind of remove stuff. Okay. Oh, I'm, I'm always sorry. afraid to do that. But okay, I can make a note of that. Um, and then on the back of seed packets, they'll give you a kind of a range of when you should plant things. How closely do you need to follow that? So like my daughter and I started planting and it said, oh, you can plant this between like January and March. And so mm -hmm. I started planting in May and she's like, no, 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 it's too late. We have to, we can't plant in May for something that was supposed to be planted no in March. So what was the crop? Can I ask the crop? Gosh, I don't know. Um, it may have been something like a, 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 let's say a zucchini or something. Okay. I, I think most of them were like nightshade, like crops, okay. like a zucchini, eggplant, peppers. And are you out here? Are you are you here in the Bay Area? Yeah, I'm on the peninsula. Oh, okay. So yeah. So no, it's not too late. I mean, everyone is putting in. It's May now, and I, I just put my some of my tomato plants in <clears throat> just last week. So um. So no, it's not too late. And fortunately, and if you live on the East Coast, you still probably have a couple more weeks before you can put out all your tomatoes. They usually would recommend um, after uh, Memorial Day. So uh, they, they have a much shorter cycle, uh, growing, uh, growing period than we do. So yeah, you can go ahead and put those things in. And it really all depends on the climate. I think that's just kind of like a general idea because you know we had a couple of cold snaps. <clears throat> in January, and if you were to put, you know, tomatoes out in January, um, the chances are they may not totally survive. So you gotta have to wait. I usually wait for like um, the last frost, which we really don't get here in the Bay Area. Um, so it's usually sometime right. around early March, is could probably be the earliest that you may want to consider um, putting things out. So the last frost is March, I usually kind of play with it a little bit and usually wait maybe like a week to a couple of weeks after. So maybe like mid to late March is when I would probably start putting in um, things like from spring stuff, nightshades and stuff. But some occasionally we get a couple cold snaps. So you kind of have to be ready for that. Okay. And then I recently picked up some seedlings from a friend of mine who just had too many, um, she started too many plants. And when I went to pick them up, she had basically like a, a big um, like bin and they were kind of sitting in water, like probably a half an inch to an inch of water. So the mm -hmm. seedlings, I guess, are being watered from the bottom. Is that mm -hmm. recommended? Would that give them too much water? 
I'd never seen it before, so I was just curious your to, take um, on it. <clears throat> it sounds like she may have grown them hydroponically or started them hydroponically. Um, you should be able to, did, like you said, it, it, it's everything is like there's several seeds in a clump. Uh, well, when I got them, several were, seedlings in a clump. When I got them, they were just the seedlings in the individual trays. So maybe she had already re like oh, separated okay. them out or something. I don't know. I just I didn't ask okay. her. Um, I was just curious if that was. So I kind of did that when I got home, just because I didn't want to let them go too dry. But um, just not sure if that would be overwatering them by keeping them kind of in a shallow bin of water. It all depends. If you're gonna go ahead and just take a look at the soil <clears throat> excuse me um okay you may want to let it kind of dry out first so if you're not really ready to kind of put them in the ground or put them in a container um wait for it to kind of okay. dry out a little bit and then see and then maybe give it just a little bit of water you don't want to overwater them too too much you don't want to give them too much water um because you could potentially kill them so i would say probably if they're all ready to be transplanted um i would go ahead and transplant them right now now's a good time and i like to transplant um early in the morning or late in the evening i try not to i'll put plants in during the heat of the day just because it kind of forces them to struggle they're already having issues by getting into a new situation or um th the fact that the sun is kind of beating down hard on them so yeah i would definitely consider doing that uh early morning or late in the evening or if your gardens whenever your garden's possibly in shade Okay, perfect. And then second last question, uh, self-watering pots. I just found these cute little, probably like eight inch pots at um, Target and they had like a rope um, around the bottom and then like a saucer. And so the, the premise is you put the water in the bottom of the saucer and then the rope will, you know, I guess the, the water will be drawn up to the rope. Sure. I don't know if it looked cute and people would buy them like I did, or if that actually is effective. Do you have any experience with that? I haven't had any experience with that, but I think that's a great idea personally, just for the fact that, you know, it's always going to be a consistent kind of thing. And then when you water it from the top, it's going to kind of re-energize the, um, in the bottom, it's going to be nice to kind of help maintain. Um, does it, um, is it if it's incorporated into the soil sometimes there might be there might be an issue with maybe roots kind of growing around it so that might be something to consider when your end of the season is done and you have to pull the plant it might be attached to the kind of to the rope um uh -huh. but that, that would be the that would be the only but that would be end of season so that shouldn't be too much of a problem you'll just kind of have to you know take some of the roots off of that but i think that sounds great okay and the final question um, I was planning to do a lot of stuff in pots, but I think I want to do raised beds. Um, what kind of soil should I use to start a raised bed? You can get a good mix at a like a at a bulk yard. Um, okay. I'm trying to remember who's down there at the down there on the peninsula with you. Um, sometimes yeah. they go by like veggie mix. Usually, it's a combination of like sandy loam and then a bunch of organic material like chicken manure or uh, great compost or worm castings and stuff like that and that would be that would be really really good and if you are going to do raised beds um, especially if you have kind of a clay soil situation uh, before you put the raised bed on top I recommend you just get a pitchfork and you kind of aerate the soil a little bit on the top and then put it on there that way it gives the organic material opportunity to kind of to penetrate through those holes um, and kind of help break up that help clay break soil up Oh, and that way so um it'll get an opportunity for the roots to really go down instead of hitting that clay soil and then just going kind of laterally you want them to really penetrate through that clay soil okay that makes a lot of sense thanks. well thank you you're welcome certainly so Lori, you're a rock star there are <laughs> three more raised hands. The ones, the questions that we got in the chat, we could possibly have you answer them via like email and put them in the newsletter or kind of get creative with that piece. Um, but it's time the class is supposed to end now. So I wanted to see if you'd be able to answer the last three raised hands. Absolutely. Bring okay, it on. So let's go to Asia. <laughs> Asia, you're on. 
Hi, Nicole. Can you hear me? Hi, sweetie. Yeah. How you doing? Yeah. <laughs> so good to see you again. Thank you for this. Hi, Lori. Hello. How are you? Good, good. Thank you. Thank you for being on. I've enjoyed this so much. So I was looking at your beautiful picture and that looks like chamomile growing. Is yes. That yes. Okay, good. So um, I just started growing chamomile and I'm like, can, can I propagate that? Or, I mean, have you had experience like with it growing or, I mean, how, how's it working out for you? And then one more question, rosemary, me and rosemary just don't get along. So I'm trying to figure out how I can nourish that relationship so I can have some rosemary in my garden this year. Okay. Well, as far as chamomile, this is the first year um, that I've grown chamomile and mm -hmm. it's been very, very successful. I've really liked it. Um, I bought a plant because I had tried to grow something by seed and the seeds never germinated. But as soon as I bought the plant, the chamomile seeds that I tried to germinate, germinate. So now I have eight plants. <laughs> um, so um, it's been working out great. I have them in a combination. I have one in a terracotta pot. <clears throat> excuse me, I have one in a plastic pot um, and they're all doing great. I'm harvesting every day. Every time mm. a bloom comes, I'm clipping, I'm clipping it off. So um, right now, because it is blooming, it's requiring a fair amount of water. So I'm having to water it um, pretty often. Mm -hmm. So, um, but other than that, it's worked out really, really great for me. And with rosemary, um, I think sometimes because rosemary is pretty drought tolerant, um, mm -hmm. Sometimes people have issues with maybe overwatering mm. rosemary. Okay, that's entirely possible too. Because mm. rosemary just wants to grow; it's gonna want to grow no matter what. Yeah. So cool. maybe put it in a terracotta pot or something. Okay, I will try that. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, you're welcome. Certainly. Good luck to you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye, bye, Asia. Bye. Let's get to Brittany Buckles. Brittany? Hi, here? thank you for staying on so late. I have bought oh. this for my house plant. Can you hear me? I can, yeah. I can see you too. Yeah. I have bought this for my house plant that was dying and it worked pretty good. It's Miracle Grow um, and it has a lot of good stuff in here but I'm a little bit worried to put it on my um, edible plants. Do you know, would you recommend putting this um, plant food on my plants that I'm gonna eat? They say like it's trusted by generations of gardeners, but I'm, I don't know. You know what, uh, to be honest, I am not a fan no. of miracle Grow. It, and the thing is, it does exactly what it says it's gonna do. They're, they are true, it gives fash, fast, lush, quick growth. And unfortunately, it's forcing our plants to, to grow way faster than they had. It's kind of like a turbo boost where it's just like all nitrogen and then it kind of fusses out. Now, the problem I have with that, or there's a couple of problems I have with that, um, it's, it's based on you know a lot of petrochemicals. So you'll find that the ingredients there end in ATE or OUS. Um, so usually they're kind yeah. of chemically, yeah. chemically it's like, grown. It's like 24% nitrogen with magnesia. I don't know. Yeah, a bunch of stuff. Like yeah. Like, so I don't I, know I, enough about it. Um, I, I have it yet. I kind of liken the growth of Miracle Grow. So imagine that you go from two years old to the age you are, <laughs> the age you are right now in two weeks time. Imagine yeah. what what a strain and what a stress that would be uh, to your body just for the fact that the chemicals are just so fast. So that's why some of the the, the techniques that I I recommend that are things that are more of a slow release, something that's going to be more natural, something that is going to exist in the soil and that the plant's going to just want to want to take up naturally. Miracle Grow is really really fast, really fast. Okay, so you think I should just throw that away? <laughs> Um, I would not recommend throwing it for a while. Away. Take it to your um, local household hazardous waste facility. They'll oh, take hazardous it. waste. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Look at your county. 
your county uh -huh. household hazardous waste. Yeah, they'll okay. definitely take it. All right, sure. I'm glad I asked you because I've been going back and forth on it all year. I'm so glad you asked. That's a great question. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you. Hi. Hi, oh, thank you so hi. much for this wonderful presentation. I, it's so helpful. Um, You're welcome. So, um, I was advised that I could use raised potting soil, raised bed in my um, containers. So I planted a whole bunch with raised bed soil in my containers. Is there anything I can do to amend that situation? Um, well, like I said, most likely the raised bed stuff is kind of like a sandy loam, um, most likely. So it's just regular kind of soil mixed in with sand to increase the kind of drainage. My only recommendation to you is would be actually to add some more organic material um, to it, especially is this some um, brand new soil or is this soil that you've used in previous years? Uh-oh. Hello? Uh-oh. I don't know if we lost her. Did we lose her? I, she might have. I, hello? It's oh, new soil. Yeah. Hi, it's new soil. It's um new organic raised bed soil. Okay, so it should already have some organic material, and I'm, I'm assuming that they let you know exactly what there is yes. in it. So yeah. it's going to be, I mean, great for, you know, kind of start. Um, your new container garden, sure, I'm sure you could definitely use that. But again, um, somewhere along the line, you're going to want to um, amend uh, during the growing period, just for the fact that you, as your plants start to get bigger and develop, they're just going to be like taking all that or um, all that nutrition out of the soil that's been put in. Okay, thank you. So, so it much. should work fine. It should work okay. fine. Cross my fingers. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>